Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, former Federal Cabinet Minister Garth Turner, who is also a frequently published financial expert on how the continued policies of the U.S. Federal Reserve are expected to affect Canada. And Keith Schaefer, publisher of the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin, on whether the B.C. government's liquid natural gas hype is deserved or is just a bunch of hot air. We'll talk to Garth Turner right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Sitting in for Phil Mackesy, here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Garth Turner, Financial Blog Award winner, financial author, advisor, and former Federal Cabinet Minister. Welcome to the show, Garth. Hi, Jim. Thank you very much. The big discussions uh, today, I guess, uh, take a look at the uh, Federal Reserve in the U.S. not changing its quantitative easing policy. That was, I think, expected. And Canada is suggesting that we need a new regulatory body to take in all the security markets across the nation. Right now, individual provinces are running that, and the federal government would like to see one big agency looking after everything. And I'm sure there's a lot of controversy about that as well. But first of all, let's take a look at the the big news from the U.S. Fed. No tapering. Yeah, it was a surprise to many people because they, the markets had really expected that the U.S. Federal Reserve would start turning back the dial that $85 billion a month that these guys have been spending buying up government securities and mortgage-backed securities that that would end. And, you know, you can't blame the market for thinking that because the U.S. Fed boss, Ben Bernanke, you know, has been saying for the past three months, dropping hints that actually this was going to take place. And the market was pretty much geared up for it. Um, and But he didn't do it. And that was taken by some people as an indication that the U.S. economy is in worse shape than they were led to believe that all this continued stimulus spending is really required. And, of course, that argument is made by all of the people who pump uh, investments that do well when they think the U.S. is doing badly. And that chief among them are these flagrant sellers of gold and silver who, in my view, will just tell people anything to scare the crap out of them and get them to buy those commodities. So gold predictably went up about 50 bucks after this announcement. Um and it's unfortunate if a lot of people think that for some reason this means the U.S. economy is on the skids. Because, Jim, this is not what this means at all, and it's not why the Fed did what they did. Why did they continue it? Well, essentially, they want the uh, U.S. economy to get as strong as possible as quickly and to do it in a way that's politically astute. There are two things to remember here. One is we're going to have a debate soon on whether the U.S. government is going to raise its debt ceiling level again. That's always a big knock them down drag them out brawl in Washington because there's a whole bunch of Republicans who'd rather see the uh, the government run out of money so Obama looks like a bum than they would to uh, raise the debt ceiling. So that that's coming down the road, and I think that Washington powers to be wanted this issue of the Fed and cutting back on stimulus off the table right now. And this was the easiest way to get it off. The second reason is this is not about stock markets or about investors. This is actually about the U.S. real estate market. And it's been doing extremely well over the past year. Prices are up, construction's up, sales are up. And it's been a huge driver of regaining confidence in the U.S. economy because when people's houses are going up in value, they feel better. And those houses have been increasing at 1% a month in value until mortgage rates started to go up. And that happened when the Fed started ruminating that it might stop this stimulus spending. And then the bond market guys went crazy, sold bonds off, forced the yields up, and pow, 
there go mortgage rates. So when mortgage rates in the U.S. went up a full percentage point, sales went down. And all of a sudden, the volume has gone off about 13%. It's the biggest drop in three years. All of a sudden, we got banks, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, all these big guys laying off thousands of people from their mortgage departments because demand has gone down. Well, that's happened pretty precipitously. I think it actually got the Fed's attention, and Bernanke said, no, nah, this is not what we want. We actually don't want higher interest rates. We want rates to stay where they are. We want people to continue to borrow their brains out, and that's the way we're going to get economic recovery. That, I think, at the end of the day, is why that decision was made, to bring down U.S. mortgage rates and to get this market rolling again. But I'll tell you, Jim, a lot of people were betting that the Fed would cut its stimulus, that that would tank uh, some markets, and there were a lot of short positions out there, and a lot of people got their uh, legs cut off <laughs> on, <laughs> on uh, Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday afternoon when this happened. Why do we allow short selling on our markets in the first place? Germany's <laughs> banned it. Yeah, well, you know, you want to take that kind of risk, you know, it's there's not a law against it. Uh, from time to time, there have been extraordinary things happen, like in the financial crisis when short selling was, was basically set aside for a while in certain areas. But I don't know. It's uh, it's gambling, for sure. Uh, it's taking an extreme position that you think th- something is going to happen. Uh, and shorts, uh, if you go shorts, you definitely have to live with the consequences. This time, they were bad. I understand that if we're expecting a change in the U.S. Federal Reserve policy, don't expect it to happen until the new year because right now they don't have any meetings planned. Usually they don't announce anything in December Mm -hmm. because everybody's mind is on Christmas. So are we going to wait now another four or five months? Uh, It's hard to say how long it's going to be. They can kind of do it whenever they want. Um, Bernanke has, you know, surprised the market twice now. He did it in June by suggesting he was going to turn off the tap. He's done it now in September by telling people he wasn't. Both of those were shocks, and they had uh, extreme market reactions. So he's not above that. I think Bernanke obviously has turned into the kind of guy who has said, I don't want the bond market telling me what to do. You know, I'm going to make sure that I'm dictating policy the way I think it should be. So he can do it any time. Tapering will happen. There is no way that these guys are going to go on spending $85 billion a month forever. It's just not going to happen. And people who don't think interest rates will normalize are living in a delusional alternative universe because interest rates will go back up. But they're not going up until the U.S. is sufficiently strong enough that it can withstand the higher rates. It's not there yet. It's that simple. But it's coming. So, um, you know, enjoy this cheap money while we got it. Canadian Finance Minister Jim Flaherty maintains Canada can have a separate monetary and interest rate policy from the U.S. Is that true? Oh, sort of. But, I mean, he's blowing smoke out of his ears, of course. Uh, you know, we, we are tied at the hip to the U.S. economy. Yes, we have our own monetary and fiscal policy, but... You know, when the U.S. Fed starts raising rates, the Bank of Canada will have to follow suit. Uh, if they don't follow suit, you're going to see the, the Canadian dollar uh, take a dive because money will migrate from Canada to the U.S. where it can earn a higher rate. So it, definitely we don't have that uh, that luxury. So in, in theory, yeah, we've got an independent policy. In practice, no, ain't going to happen. Do we need higher interest rates to encourage saving? <laughs> Short answer, yes. But I think we need higher interest rates to stop people being so horny for real estate. I think that's the problem. And we have very little in the way of savings and investments now because so much money has been sucked into this real estate uh, vortex. Uh, and that's a real concern to policymakers. We have $1.1 trillion now in outstanding mortgages. That's phenomenal for a country of 32 million people. And we've got a 70% home ownership level, one of the highest in the world. So when 7 out of 10 people own houses and those houses have been going up in value, so mortgage debt has been going up, we have a real estate market that's built on credit and not income growth. 
you know, people don't buy houses in Vancouver for two million bucks because they're all investment bankers making 800,000 a year. They're buying those houses because credit's cheap and the banks are willing to hand it out. And, and that's why it's a dangerous situation. So when interest rates go up, obviously it makes houses less affordable because mortgages are more costly. That will be uh, something that really gets people uh, upset. It's going to hurt the real estate market fundamentally when it takes place, um, but it will take place. So we need to get used to the idea now. How many Canadians are uh, half a percentage point or 1% higher on their mortgage away from defaulting? Huh. I, well, quite a few. Default is not the epidemic in Canada that it has been in the States when things get bad. Uh, people tend to hang on to their homes. The real problem is they stop spending on other stuff. So all of a sudden, they're not selling high-def TVs at Best Buy anymore and not by selling so many you know, cars, new cars. And that's where you get the real economic impact. That's where the Bank of Canada is worried about, that, um, that we're getting so much dependence on real estate that when the inevitable happens, that we will um, see economic growth stagnate because of a drop in consumer spending. And that will certainly send unemployment up. It's a vicious circle that could start. That's why they've been trying to cool off the real estate market uh, systematically over the past two years by dropping 30-year amortizations, by you know restricting credit at the banks, by changing formula for first-time buyers. All of these things are quite deliberate. They haven't quite worked yet, but they're still going to try. Do you think governments uh, believe they have more influence on the market than they really have? Uh, yeah, governments do have a certain uh, impact, for sure, in terms of the housing market. Um, they do, and this policy of cheap money, which has been a fundamental government policy, that certainly has spurred real estate. Uh, when the money is withdrawn, it will hurt real estate. So there is definitely an impact by governments, but it's uh, it's a big global economy right now, and uh, governments at all levels are struggling. It takes us back to the Fed. You know, the Fed's been trying to uh, rekindle the U.S. economy with trillions of dollars, and it's it's worked. It hasn't been gangbusters, and it certainly hasn't been cheap, but it, it's worked to a certain extent. But I still think all policymakers are frustrated that the economy still remains sluggish. China is cracking down on fraud, something fierce. And a lot of companies who were used to doing business as usual there, which means a lot of money under the table, now are being told that's not the way China does business anymore. Uh, can we believe that? <laughs> well, it's hard to be uh, sure about what comes out of China because it isn't exactly an open society. Uh, we don't have good data. Um, so who knows? Uh, it probably is a good thing. I mean, China is an extremely important economic force in the world now. Second biggest economy in the world now, bigger than Japan's. That happened a couple of years ago. And so it's definitely a force that, to be reckoned with. Uh, China does have an influence on all of the developed world now. Uh, obviously, uh, when the Chinese economy is growing, it uh, is a huge consumer of, of raw materials. And Canada is a direct beneficiary of that. There has been, you know, rumors of a lot of graft and corruption in China. I'm not in a position to to know how serious that is. I, I do look at attempts by Beijing to bring things under control, and I, I think they're good. I applaud that. They certainly have been trying to address their housing bubble in China, and they seem to have done a fairly good job at containing that. Um, however, there is a ton of overbuilding um, going on there. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, I do think China is going to surprise on the upside. I think there'll be more economic growth in China than a lot of people have, have believed. And I do think they'll be certainly running at somewhere between 7 and 9% annual growth over the next little while. And that's going to be ultimately pretty, pretty bullish for uh, the commodity sector. And of course, now uh, the government has announced we're not just going to be the maker of cheap goods to export to other countries. We're becoming a consuming nation, and we want to encourage that. And their middle class literally is growing by tens of thousands of people a day. Yeah, it is, actually. And can the latest numbers on retail sales were pretty um, amazing, up 13% uh, retail sales in China in the last period. And that was uh, quite bullish. So, yeah, the middle class there is an emerging force. 
uh, it is going to impact the entire world because there's so many people. Uh, so it changes the agricultural patterns, for example. You've got a massive demand now more for uh, grain-fed uh, meat than we've had in the past, and that certainly has been changing um, what is grown around the world and, and what is raised. And the appetite for energy is another thing. I do think that long-term people would be pretty wise to invest in, in energy in all sources. Uh, the price of oil is probably going to be testing its all-time high again. Was, as you remember, more than $140 an ounce prior to the economic collapse. I, I certainly can see $150 or $200 a, I'm sorry, I said an ounce, a barrel, $150 <laughs> or an ounce. Two, oh, yeah, that is, that is steep. <laughs> exactly. I was thinking gold. But uh, $150 or $200 a barrel certainly in the future is, uh, is not, uh, out of the question at all. Mostly because of that tremendous demand coming from that middle class. So there are some good plays long term for people, and I think they're uh, definitely in your portfolio. You might want to look at having uh, some good exposure to that sector. Liquefied natural gas really being touted by the B.C. government as the wave of the future. Uh, is that a correct presumption? I don't know. I'm not uh, an expert about it. Um, I, I'm not quite as hot as maybe uh, Premier uh, is on this whole area. Uh, natural gas prices have been uh, terrible for quite some period of time. There's a huge surplus in North America right now. And, um, you know, as the United States becomes more energy efficient or self-sufficient, uh, I'm just not sure that Canada is not going to get the, the wrong end of the stick in this whole thing. Uh, I'm, my, my own feeling is I think liquefied nat- natural gas is... Uh, really not as attractive right now as a petroleum play. Uh, going back to the uh, fraud front, uh, the World Bank has said uh, Canada has moved to the top of the fraudulent company list. Last year we didn't have any. Now they say there's 117 fraudulent Canadian companies they're worried about. However, all but two of them are SNC-Lavalin, the Montreal-based engineering firm. And they've been banned from uh, bidding on any World Bank-sponsored projects for the next 10 years. Is this a big black eye for Canada internationally because we've been known as a very honest nation, or is this a one-off? I think it's both. I think it's a black eye. There's no doubt about it. SNC-Lavalin has a global reputation, and uh, these guys have done work everywhere. So now they've been tarred with this big black brush, and it, it just looks bad on everybody. Um, it's amazing what apparent corruption was going on uh, with that company and its international relations. And I think it's it's going to hurt uh, the engineering sector and it's going to hurt Canada to a certain extent. But, you know, we're still a pretty up upfront place. I mean, I really wouldn't compare us with what goes on in a lot of third world countries. Uh, I think Canadian business by and large is um, run by some pretty ethical people, but not too many of them in the SNC Lavalin building, apparently. Is this part of the overall construction scandal that's being investigated in Quebec right now? Is that just kind of the, the culture there? Uh, it seems to be. And again, I'm not really that well versed on it, but as I take a look at that, it's uh, pretty appalling. And, uh, as you know, the, uh, inquiry goes on in that province and it was pretty much responsible, I would say, for the downfall of Monsieur Charest as uh, Premier of Quebec uh, and for the end of his political career, which was always rather promising. Uh, so the construction uh, uh, corruption seems to be rife in Quebec, and uh, I think there's um, more uh, sad tales to come out of that. So maybe it is part of the culture, Jim. Maybe you're right. Should uh, the rest of Canada be worried that the same thing is spilled over, or is this more or less contained in Quebec? Uh, <laughs> let's hope so. I, I drive over a lot of bridges. I don't want them falling down. Yeah, well, I thought when you know big hunks of the Olympic Stadium started falling down in the middle of the night, we were just lucky that you know 60,000 <laughs> people weren't in there to watch an Alouettes oh. game. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's all scary. Uh, but, you know, the whole infrastructure thing in North America is just something you don't want to think about a whole bunch. There's so so much money going to have to be spent uh, in the future, but I think in Quebec they have some special problems. Can Canada afford to uh, repair all these bridges? Right in Vancouver, we have a 50-year-old bridge, the Patello, that you can see hunks of concrete falling off of and pieces of rebar rusted away. A lot of the country like that? 
Yeah, it is. And governments have a particular problem because coming out of the 2008-2009 recession, of course, government revenues just plunged by about 40% federally uh, because the tax base was eroding. Uh, businesses just weren't manufacturing uh, rep profits to be taxed and people weren't doing well. So that's where we got the highest federal deficit in history happened in 2010-2011. Uh, and we're still dealing with the legacy of that. So there are not billions hanging around to go out and build new bridges um, and uh, construct highways. So I think this is going to be a long-term problem. Uh, and definitely it's going to uh, tick off, I think, people in their uh, 20s and 30s right now. There's a big legacy of debt and um, uh, capital projects being left for that generation really is going to have to finance, and the only way to do it is through continued uh, withering taxes. Wow. And, of course, a lot of these people are coming out of college with a massive student debt. Now they're going to have to start building new bridges. Yeah, that's right. Maybe Sorry, they should kid. get engineering degrees and get a part of that. <laughs> exactly. Either that or get into concrete forming. Garth, uh, thanks a lot for talking to us. Maybe, uh, again, just tell us uh, what your website is. I know people really appreciate your opinions and, and respect them. Well, thank you. I'm not sure they re respect them that much, but they can come and have a <laughs> chuckle and read a few anyway. Greaterfool.ca, I write a blog uh, six days a week, deals with the economy, finances, investing, and real estate. So, yeah, come on over. We have a lot of fun. Thanks a lot again. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. After the break, Keith Schaefer on This Week in Money. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600. 604-699-8600. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of Oil & Gas Investments Bulletin. Welcome to the show, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Boy, a lot happening now with liquefied natural gas. It appears to be the fuel of the future. BC's well poised, but my first question has to be, look at the competition. Every country in the world, it seems, now says they have lots of frackable natural gas. Can we compete? Yes, I absolutely think we can. You know, the, the reality is that we are the closest to the key markets. So that, that being South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, China, it takes us about just over seven days to get a, a ship over there from Prince Rupert, and it would take about nine days from most other places in the world. So it re, we have just a natural advantage, and we the other natural advantage we have is that you know our gas is pretty well the cheapest in the world. Like our Natural gas here in Canada right now is around 250 uh, an MCF, a thousand cubic feet, and uh, it, it'll go higher than that in the winter, back up over three dollars. But that still, even for North America, is very cheap. So I, I see us having really good logistics, really good pricing, educated workforce. Like there's a lot going for us here. I saw one of the jobs that's really going begging is being a pipeline construction worker. You know what? That that makes me so sad to hear because uh, particularly in the urban centers around Canada and all of North America, everyone's so fixated on on white collar jobs. And these guys, what, what, what's happened with pipeline construction jobs, for example, is that their accommodations has just improved so much. The the the, the work and and how you do your work has improved so much. It, it it's so much more automated and and where these guys get to stay in camps and things that that business has just skyrocketed. These guys get to stay in, it's not a palace, but it's a beautiful, equivalent to a beautiful suburban home, uh, out in the bush. So it's, it, that's, that's, that's too bad. Well, what kind of pay are they looking at? Oh, you know what? I, I don't have any statistics on that, but I, 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 I gotta tell you that, uh, there's lots of money in the oil patch for those types of jobs. Th these are high paying jobs. Now, for people looking to invest in oil and gas, Canada is still the best bet in the world. I know prices are low, but look at the potential. I think we're in a great spot right now. You know, we've got on the West Coast all the liquid natural gas that it has the potential to get to Asia and capture a huge arbitrage between the high Asian prices of like 14 to $16 in MCF versus the 2 to $3 here. 
And on the oil side, you know, it, it's well documented just how great a resource the oil sands are. And, and, you know, our costs there are getting cheaper and cheaper. Years ago, people said, oh, you're, you know, your break-even costs on those are $80, $90 a barrel. Well, you're operating break-even costs on these are, are down in the 30 or 40s. You're, you're not going to see any oil sands production get shut in from low oil prices. I understand if you're looking for investment properties, uh, small LNG companies probably better than the big ones? You know, the, the jury's still out on that, but here's what I'd, I'd tell you, Jim, is that the first project that's going to go off the west coast of Canada is going to be a very new small-scale technology. So uh, most of the big projects off Western Canada are anywhere from 2 billion cubic feet a day to 5 billion cubic feet a day. Those are, you can hardly even imagine how much gas that is. Like all of Canada only produces about 13 billion a day. So you're talking about taking 10 to 15 percent of the entire country's production in just one terminal. So what is going to happen first is there's going to, there's new technology being developed right now where the big terminals are actually going to be housed on quite small ships. And the technology is there now. It's being developed to make that economic. So it's only that the first one is only going to be about 0.2 BCF a day. So literally one-tenth to one-twentieth the size of all the other proposals. And it's being done by uh, a British company called Golar. And they've partnered up with the Heisler First Nation. And the project is so small, it did not need environmental approval. So they should be in production in about two years. When this first thing came out about liquefied natural gas to Japan and the rest of Asia, I asked, are there enough, uh, I call them golf ball ships. If you look at the freighter, the tanker that carries it, it's like they have two or three giant golf balls on their deck. Well, at the time, there weren't enough ships to kind of meet the current demand, let alone now. How's that shipbuilding going? Shipbuilding is doing great. Uh, you know, you're going to see a huge increase in the fleet, the worldwide fleet here. Right now there's about 360 ships, give or take. And uh, I think you're going to see that really start to pick up. So the, the market is relatively well supplied with those ships. We are talking about these ships getting a little more scarce, a little more tight on supply probably in a year or two when a lot of the Australian production comes on stream. And, and there's even a chance that, uh, you know, the, both the first U.S. and the first Canadian could be on stream then as well. So uh, one of the companies that I follow quite closely is a company called Golar. The symbol is GLNG and the NASDAQ. They, they're, they've got about 13 ships right now, and they're going to be doubling their fleet size in the next 15 to 18 months. Our matey. Just uh, that Captain Phillips movie, by the way, that's coming out about the uh, U.S. freighter hijacked in the Imani Gulf looks fascinating because I remember covering that. That would be, uh, uh, yeah, Tom Hanks is in the lead role. Yes. That, would be, uh, that should be a great movie. Yeah, because watching the footage, there was enough real news footage from that that uh, it just, I went, oh, my God, there we are. And, yeah, by the way, we'll cut this out. No worries. Yeah. So it looks like instead of just investment opportunities, there's job opportunities, and perhaps people who think, oh, my God, we have petroleum products moving around everywhere, does not BC live on natural resources? Oh, Jim, there's going to be a huge regional play here. It's not just going to be oil and gas jobs. The spin-off jobs usually have like a multiplier of three to one. So you're talking about bringing in, you know, 10,000 jobs plus to build one of these big uh, export terminals. They're called liquefaction plants. And, and that's going to be, you know, th these plants cost probably $7 billion dollars. So, you're, like I say, with the multiplier, you're talking about adding, you know, 30,000 people uh, into a very tight area. You know, Kitimat's only like 7,000 people, and Prince Rupert, I think, is 12,000 people. So you're talking about a huge influx of workers that's just going to be a boom for the entire economy. It's just, it's not going to be just oil and gas specific. It, it Everybody's going to make money. The real estate guys, the banks, it, it's going to be good for everybody. And I think uh, Prince Rupert, is it not in a direct line the closest point from mainland North America to Japan? For the terminals that are projected now, yes, they are. So uh, th that's what I mean. They, they, they're they the closest. So you're talking about seven days each way, and so that gives us a big natural advantage over other people. Yeah, distance and time. Isn't that business? 
Time is money. You got it. And at $100,000 a day for one of these LNG ships, that can add up very fast. Now, I know a lot of people hate fracking. They think it's horrible. And I could see how local effects could happen. But is it a dangerous practice? Is the environment, you know, in danger? No, I don't, I don't think so. You know, we, we, we've fracked now for over 50 years. And I, I think where people get their concerns is two places. Uh, they, they, they are concerned that some of the chemicals used in fracking could migrate up to groundwater. But, you know, all this fracking is done usually about a mile or two below the surface, whereas groundwater is more like three to 400 feet. So when you've got 3,000 feet of granite, impenetrable, impenetrable granite in between, you're not going to see migration unless you have a bad cement job on the well. And that has happened a couple times before. I know in Canada got their fingers wrapped for that. Uh, I believe it was in Wyoming. Uh, the other thing that people get confused about, Jim, is that there is a lot of naturally occurring methane in sh- in shallow depths in several places around the world. And so when you see, uh, like in the movie Gasland, where you know people's tap c- can get lit on fire, that's from naturally occurring gas. My hometown, Peace crack. River. My hometown, Peace River. Uh, a few clicks up the river north of the town of Peace River, there's a natural, natural gas fire. It's a sandbar. You go and you throw a match on it, it sets on fire. That That's how you. close the natural gas is to where they live. And didn't Mark Twain call Medicine Hat or Lethbridge the town with all of hell beneath it because of all of their natural gas? And as we can see, both those communities have thrived since. But even Mark Twain knew about Alberta's natural gas, BC's natural gas. My question, too, is before all, you know, this public fracking thing happened, BC was told we have 200 years of proven reserves of natural gas. Why do we have to frack? Well, when when someone says that, and I'm not familiar with that uh, quote, but when someone says that, uh, obviously you have to get that out of the ground. So uh, if that's in what we'd call the old conventional style play where you didn't need to frack and you had a natural gas pool that was trapped up against some rock, then obviously don't need to frack. But a lot of the new resources that we're seeing, and, and, and actually pretty well all of them, are locked into what we call tight rock formations, whether it's shale or sandstone or mudstone. So uh, somehow that gas has to be liberated out of the rock, and that has to be done through fracking or some kind of stimulation. So that that's what the technology is all about. So I, I, I guess I'm not sure where that quote really originated from, but it really depends on where that gas is, what kind of host rock that gas is. Now, the source of information was the B.C. government. As you know, the government always tells us the truth. We're gotcha. laughing now, aren't we? <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen the context for the quote, so, but... but. Um, uh, oh, all BC that does have is, a lot of gas. Yeah, there, there, I, I agree that there is a lot of gas here, but generally most of it does need to get fracked. Keith, you have a big conference coming up where people can find out, should you be investing in oil and gas? Can you tell us about it? Sure. We've got a, a conference on Wednesday, September 25th, at the Pan Pacific Hotel in Vancouver, and it's really focused on the opportunity in LNG, liquid natural gas. So I've brought in two speakers. One is a fund manager from Calgary, Chris Teal, who's going to be talking to us about, uh, you know, kind of how to play the LNG build out and in, in equities. And, and then our other speaker is Nathan Weiss, who's flying in from Boston. He runs a service called Unit Economics. And Nathan is one of the few truly original thinkers in the market today. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have him coming to my conference all the way out here. He's going to go through the very granular economics of BC LNG versus the rest of the world. So I think people are really going to find that quite fascinating when he's going to be able to put some hard numbers on it and you're going to be able to walk out there with a really good idea of just how competitive we can be in the world. And I've also brought in seven public companies that I think are going to benefit from LNG. A couple very heavily gas-weighted producers with big resources that I think could be takeout candidates as the LNG game moves forward. And then uh, a couple drilling support companies. So the drilling right now is where all the action is happening in LNG. Those are the stocks that are getting the love right now. And then I also have three construction service companies. And, and as these liquefaction plants get built, Jim, they are the, going to be the guys who really get to benefit. I know people always have safety concerns when you're transporting any kind of a 
flammable anything. I, I guess when you have the storage facilities there at your ports, you know, you'll have dikes and stuff around them that if they did go up, the blast goes straight up. Uh, I'm sure that because uh, apart from that, if there's a natural gas spill, it just goes skyward until there's a spark. Are people assured that this will be a fa- you know, a very safe facility? Well, I can tell you that there's little doubt in my mind that the way that BC Premier Christy Clark has campaigned that anything is going to get done in LNG unless safety is absolutely the top. Uh, you know, we haven't had a lot of experience with LNG, obviously, in North America, because what happened in the U.S. was they built all these import plants, and then, of course, we discovered shale gas, so most of them hardly even didn't get used. So it, it is a new game, but it's going to be very tightly regulated, and I really don't see... You know, we, we've had oil tanker traffic up and down the coast for decades now, and in BC we've never had a, a, a spill. So it's I, always I, been double hulled tankers. That's right. So I, I really do believe the industry is up for it, and the industry is going to be working with government to put together uh, all the right things to make sh- like, like there's just no doubt that safety is going to be top of mind. And again, for people looking for jobs, if you're concerned about the environment, why not? Hire on with a company that tries to make sure they look after it. Oh, you're lots of environmental servicing work get done. Absolutely. No question about that. Uh, taking a look at the future now, again, when I talk about can BC compete, every country in the world now says they have liquefied natural gas just available at the turn of a tap. You said our competitive difference is the speed to Asia and across the Pacific. But now they're talking about massive inter-ocean pipelines carrying this stuff. Again, could we compete? Well, you know, Russia is talking about doing that to Japan, and, and that's something that we really could not compete on. Uh, at the same time, there's going to be huge capital costs to that. And I, I just see, particularly with the potential for small-scale LNG uh, and how cheap that could end up being, uh, it's a new technology. We've got educated workforce, we've got distance on our side, so I see us having a very good chance of reaping a lot of benefit here. And I can throw in some politics. Don't forget, Russia cut off Ukraine's natural gas supply in the middle of winter over a price dispute. Do you want to be held hostage to that? I mean, they play for real. Yeah, the Japanese only have to ask Europe how uh, how it is to rely on Gazprom, you bet. And natural gas po- politics again, uh, Syria, Saudi Arabia. It's incredible how the whole world is so connected to energy supplies and how somebody finding, you know, a new natural gas pool, uh, somewhere in Asia affects prices here and how we work. The whole point now with LNG is that gas is going to become a relatively global commodity. So it's been a very regional commodity up until now, but I think you're going to see it go global here. And uh, so what you're saying is true. You know, it really is going to be interesting to see what kind of impact the globalization is on the price. I know uh, certain people in government have been ridiculed for looking 10, 15 years ahead. Yeah, look at our competitors, China. To them, 15 years is a second. Yes. So uh, I mean, we're finally catching on, I think, to the way Asia does work. Right, and, and and I think, uh, in fact, you're almost seeing a a, a a changing of the views here because you're looking at all these Asian buyers of LNG wanting to change from oil indexed pricing because LNG generally trades about 12 percent or 13 percent of Brent, so one eighth the price of Brent. So what they're saying is we now want to take advantage of the low U.S. gas prices and base our pricing on gas linked pricing and that just doesn't work for the producers because the returns not there no one's going to go out and spend seven billion dollars without a guaranteed return on investment over a 20-year time frame and of course again they understand the importance of long-term investment and commitment and finally i think maybe canada i know somebody said we're uh kowtowing to china but if that's where your markets are, you really do have to build relationships. Yeah, it, it's just a dance that's happening right now, Jim. There's a, there's give and take, and right now you're having a little bit of a standoff here between the groups. But 
Well, the way the industry is getting around that is including the Asian utilities in the LNG facilities. So basically, you're you're bringing your buyer into your group so that you know if 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 they think they're getting price gouged, well then they're going to benefit on on this side of it. But it really does uh, create a situation where if you've got the end user on your side while you're producing it, you know that puts a lot of comfort level in the people that they're getting the right price. Your overall take then on the Canadian liquefied gas market? Well, I, I, I think it's going to really speed up here quite a bit this fall. I, I expect a final investment decision by the small group run by Golar and, and the Heisler First Nation, and then uh, we'll see very steady construction work as, as that moves forward. And then just as that goes into production here in 2015, I would expect at least two of the other uh, proposals to become final and work begin then as well. Looks pretty bright. We have a lot going for us. There's a lot of naysayers out there, Jim, and that it, it everyone uh, wants to appear balanced. But the reality is that uh, we have a lot of blessings here. So we just have to. There's, it's not like it's it's a free ride. There's there are some hurdles here, but just getting the business done. It's strictly execution now. We've we've got the gas. We've got the proximity. Let's go do it. And, of course, involving First Nations first is probably the best idea. It's their land. On, on some of the places, it absolutely is. You're right. So it, it makes a lot of sense. So that's, I think, kudos to the Heisler for being open to doing business, and kudos to the uh, Golar guys and the, and the Tatham brothers there for bringing them in. Keith, uh, once again, maybe you could uh, name your website so people can check out your views and what you think are good ideas. Sure, Jim. Thank you. It's uh, www.oilandgas-investments.com. Thanks to our guests, Garth Turner and Keith Schaefer, and thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard for Phil Mackesy. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. 